If you love me, please don't judge me Got my hands tied, the power's above me Don't shoot the messenger, I'm just a puppet here If you wanna place blame, then look to the puppeteer Family, fortune, envy, jealousy, privilege Passed on, legacy, secret, sabotage, borderline, felony Suicide, subtract, selfish, pedigree Well, this weekend was just typical vintage Richmond for you. I mean, this weekend really showed that Richmond doesn't need fucking two dates. I think Richmond would be better off with only one date. I'd say just give Richmond only one date for 2023 and so on. And then give their second date to a track. To a track that deserves a cup date, you know. Look at a track like Iowa or North Wilkesboro or Rockingham or Nashville Fairgrounds, etc, etc. Or even go like to Portland and shit. Or even go to Canada. Oh, in Me or Mexico, any of that shit. Like, all options on the table. Like, Richmond 100% needs to lose a date. But yeah, and this weekend, there wasn't a whole lot of racing this weekend. There were, like, only two races this week, and they were trucks and cup both at Richmond. Xfinity was off this week. Penny Series doesn't run till Tuesday night, which I'll be at that race, by the way. So there's a vlog coming Wednesday. And Modifieds don't run till Wednesday night. And ARCA has two races next weekend. Like, there's not much race. There was no racing this weekend. Not even IndyCar was running this week. And F1 is still in their summer break. But yeah, still, very quiet weekend for racing this week. So let's go over to two racings and see how it got, went this week. So, starting off, we have the Truck Series race at Richmond. And really, this race, for the much part of this race, this race was mainly between... Ty Majeski and Chandler Smith for much of the race. Like, Ch like Ty Majeski had a really solid run in this race. Like, Majeski, I've always said at the start of Chase, Majeski was going to be a dark horse contender for the championship. And I think he really proved that tonight at, um, at Richmond. But in the end, it still wasn't enough to deal with Chandler Smith. And despite the best efforts from John Hunter Nemechek and company, it still wasn't enough to stop. Chandler Smith, and Chandler Smith, he just flat out dominated this race, like, nobody was on Chandler Smith's level in tonight at Richmond, and Chandler Smith goes on and gets his third win of the season, winning at Richmond, and with this win, it means that Chandler Smith has officially locked himself into the round of eight. So, yeah, Chandler Smith, he joins Scran and Finger as the only two drivers that enter the cutoff race at Kansas in the f next month, safe in the points. Since, yeah, the next truck race isn't for a month until we go to Kansas. Because that's how fucked up the schedules are for both sides. But yeah, Jammer Smith moves on. And really, everybody else is pretty much safe on points. Like, maybe um, Ben Rhodes is the only other safe question mark with 21 points above the cut line. And Ben Rhodes had another struggling run. Like, all Ben Rhodes has to do at Kansas is just stay, have a clean race and stay out of trouble. And he moves on. It's really tight for that 8th spot. And we're going to go over the Truck Series points at the end of the race. But yeah, just Chandler Smith has had a career year. And I think Chandler Smith, he's going to be one of those drivers competing for the title this year. So yeah, Chandler Smith, he officially is moving on to the next round. So yeah, Chandler Smith moves on in this truck race. So that's just the truck race at Richmond. It was just a Chandler Smith show. At least Corey Heim and Taylor Gray both had solid runs in the race like both Taylor Gray and Corey Himes showed why both one or both of them should be full-time in trucks next year. Especially Corey Heim. Heim should be full-time for KBM next year. And um, Taylor Gray, he should also be full-time. Probably with DGR Crosby, maybe the 17 truck. We'll have to see what happens with him. Time will tell. But I think Taylor Gray is ready to go full-time in trucks. You know, he's had some really good runs at ARCA. I think for Taylor Gray, it's time. It's time for Taylor Gray to go to trucks. It's time. But before we go on to the Cup Series race at Richmond, we do have some silly season updates to go through here. So, of course, the big silly season news that came out this week is the 42 car at Petty GMS. Of course, Ty Dillon getting the axe after one season. So, for Ty, get, so Ty Dillon, yeah, I know Ty Dillon sucks, but really to only give him one year... When one a guy has gone that early, somebody fucked up the hiring process at Petty GMS. But in the end, so taking the 42 car, 
will be Noah Gregson. So yeah, Noah Gregson has a full-time Cup Series ride. I honestly thought Gregson would have gone full-time with Colleague Racing, but Petty GMS, that is an interesting option. Um, I'm not sure. It could be a bridge deal to until the A car opens up at RCR since there have been some reports about Gregson going there. So maybe Gregson goes to Petty GMS for a year until the 8 car when opens up when Reddick leaves for 2311. We'll have to see there. But yeah, Noah Gregson, I've always said he was ready to go full-time at Cup this year. And I think it's, yeah, now it's time. Gregson's going to run full-time in the Cup Series next year in 2023. Now, whether he'll be eligible for Rookie of the Year or not, that's yet to be seen because he's run nearly half the season this year in the, in Cup so we'll have to see if he's eligible for a rookie of the year next year or not. You know, we'll have to see what Bobby P has to say. But yeah, so now in Xfinity, that opens up the nine car for at, at Junior Motorsports. And there's been two rumored drivers for that car. The two drivers rumored for that car are Carson Hosevar and Drew fucking Dollar. Why the fuck is Drew Dollar linked to this car? Why the fuck is Drew Lock even a consideration for the nine car at Junior Motorsports? Drew Lock fucking sucks. He's fucking garbage. He's ass in trucks, and he was ass in fucking Arca. Where like you're literally considering replacing Gregson with him? You have to be fucking shitting me. I bet. I hope to God it's fucking Carson Hosevar. Hosevar is more worthy of that fucking car than Drew Dollar. Like, let's be real. The only reason Drew Dollar's linked to that car is because he has financial backing behind him. And like I said last week with Brett Moffitt, it doesn't matter how talented you are. If you have funding behind you, you'll go far in the sport. If you have no financial funding behind you, you will not last in the sport. And yeah, Dollar just so happens to have financial backing behind you. So it's just a paid driver getting a top-seated ride, and Drew Dollar's probably going to do next to fucking nothing in that car. And it's a damn tragedy, because that because if Dollar gets that car, the nine car next year would potentially go from being a championship contender to be one of the worst cars at Junior Motorsports. Please, for the love of God, let it be Carson Josevar in that nine car next year. Anybody but Drew fucking Dollar, please. Like, literally, Dale, J Dale Jr. Out of any fucking driver you could have poached from KBM, you chose the worst driver they have there. Like, we're not talking Chandler Smith, or Sammy Smith, or Corey Heim. We're talking Drew fucking Dollar? Are you fucking kidding me? Fuck out of here. Like, fuck right off. Honestly, I'd rather have terrible fucking Herps than Drew fucking Dollar. And Rowley Herbst has been pretty decent this year. I would rather have him over Drew fucking Dollar. Anybody but Drew Dollar in that nine car, please. So now on to the cup race at Richmond. And really this cup race, well, this cup race, it wasn't a good race. And it wasn't a bad race at the same time. It was average at best. Like, it was mediocre. Like, the only thing that would have saved this race was pitch strategy, but that strategy didn't really happen. Because the spring race was a lot better than the fall race, because the spring race had pitch strategy, because everyone was on different strategies to sign what would win, track position or fresh tires. And really, everyone saw the strategy that Denny Hamlin won at, in, at Richmond in the spring with, and they all did, everyone did that exact fucking strategy. So really, the one thing that made Richmond great in the spring is now gone. Like, this race was just vintage Richmond. Like, the early part of this race, um, Chastain dominated the early part of this race and won the stage. But the second stage on, Chastain's car really went down a fucking hill. Like, that car had a lot of issues. And then, the, then from there on out, the first half of the race then was Joey Logano. But then the start, the second half of the race, Kevin Harvick came to life and Harvick dominated the remaining portion of the race. Like, the only question was what this pit strategy is, do you pit early or do you pit later for fresher tires? But everyone's on the same strategy. Like, that was the only thing that was going to decide. What was going to win? Pitting's early or pitting later? And in the end, the battle, it was mainly a battle between Kevin Harvick and Chris Buescher. But again, despite Busher's best efforts, he just could not get by Kevin Harvick, and Busher just burned his stuff up. 
But in the closing laps of the race, Christopher Bell, who pitted 12 laps later than Harvick and company, Bell ended up rocketing through the field on the fresh tires and would get by Busher in the closing laps. And Bush was able to run down Harvick, but in the end, Chris Busher just ran out of time to catch Harvick. And Kevin Harvick, he would hold off Chris Busher late in the race. And Kevin Harvick, within two weeks, Harvick goes from a goes from being 96 points out of the chase of the must-win scenario. And Kevin Harvick has now become the first driver this season to win back-to-back -back races. So Harvick now gets his second win of the season. So Harvick gets his second win. And let's be real, if this race had one more lab, Bell would have passed Kevin Harvick for the win, no doubt, in my mind. But yeah, Harvick gets his 60th career win, which ties him with Kyle Busch for ninth on the all-time wins list. And now the next driver ahead of ahead of him is Dale Earnhardt on the all-time wins list at 76. So yeah, Kevin Harvick, he's really showing why he's a very underrated driver. And you look at Kevin Harvick's career ever since moving to Stuart Haas Racing. Before he came to Stuart Haas, he only had 23 career wins before moving to Stuart Haas Racing. Since leaving, um, since leaving RCR, Harvick has won 37 races in the last nine seasons. Jesus Christ. Like, no doubt, Kevin Harvick leaving Richard Childress Racing to go to Stuart Haas. He will go down as one of the best team changes in NASCAR history. I mean, Harvick does have a championship to answer for it, too. But yeah, Harvick gets his second one of the year, and I'd say watch out for Kevin Harvick. Because Kevin Harvick, he could be, he might be, a, he might be a solid dark horse contender for the championship this year. I think now Harvick is officially a top five driver this season. Like that old, like the old bastard, definitely has something left in the tank. I think he's got one more championship run left in him before he hangs it up. But yeah, and also with this win for Harvick, it also means one thing: Kevin Harvick, the old bastard, has officially punched his ticket into the chase. And I say watch out for Harvick. Do not sleep on him. He might be the biggest dark horse enter in the chase. So Kevin Harvick has officially punched his ticket. But that's not the only ticket that's been punched to the chase this week. Because even though Kyle Busch fans. You've all had a massive summer from hell. Because you haven't had a top 10 finish since the gateway race. When, you fin when Kyle Busch finished second to Logano. Even though technically you did have that second place at Pocono, but that doesn't count because he got disqualified for some tape on the car. But in the end, Kyle Busch did end the top 10 with streak. He got ninth at Richmond, and he gains enough points to be ahead of the cut line, ahead of Kurt Busch, after Kurt Busch has now missed his fourth race in a row with the concussion. Um, when is NASCAR going to take Kurt Busch's waiver away? Because this is getting ridiculous. Honestly, at this point, competing in every fucking race at this point is just a fucking suggestion at this point. Like, it would be pretty, pretty asinine if they let Kurt Busch fucking just still compete in the chase if he misses the final six races of the regular season. Like, Kurt Busch should have to compete at Daytona to still have that waiver. Like, the fact that they're gonna still, that they'll let Kurt Busch have the waiver, even if he misses the rest of the regular season, is fucking asinine. But despite that, Kyle Busch fans, you've had a rough year. You know, we don't know what Kyle Busch's future is with JGR, if he's going to Stuart Haas next year or where the hell he's going. But hey, Kyle Busch fans, take one solid note in this. At least you made the chase this year and you're locked in. So now with all that, that means now 10 spots in the chase have officially been locked up. And now with two races left until the chase begins, two races in the remaining regular season remaining, only six spots are still up for grabs in the chase. And Ryan Blaney, he also increases his gap over Martin Truex Jr. Whether that battle between them for that 16th spot means anything or not is, up, is yet to be seen. But yeah, and also if anyone's wondering, no, Chase Elliott did not clinch the regular season championship. Chase Elliott needed to be 118 points ahead of Blaney to lock up the title. Chase Elliott leaves Richmond... 116 points ahead of Blaney. So Chase Elliott missed clinching the title at Richmond by only two 
fucking points. Here's the good news, though. Chase, the title's on hold this week. That's the bad news. The good news is Chase Elliott has a 99.9% .9 chance of clinching it at Watkins Glen next week. Since at Watkins Glen, Chase Elliott can clinch it if he leaves rich, if he leaves the track 59 points ahead of Ryan Blaney or whoever's second in points. And also, I should mention here, I actually did some math. Chase Elliott, he would have to finish 34th or better, regardless of what Blaney does, to lock up the regular season championship next week. And oh yeah, Watkins Glen happens to be Chase Elliott's best track. So yeah, that's why I said Chase Elliott has a 99.9% .9 chance of locking, locking up the regular season championship next week. So yeah, any celebrations I had planned for Chase Elliott winning the regular season title, that shit is on hold for at least a week. But, you know, but he's more than likely going to clinch it next week. But yeah, Chase Elliott, no, he pretty much has it in the bag. He'll have fish, we have that title next week. But yeah, that's just that there. And that's really about it. I mean, Richmond really proved why we shouldn't have fucking two dates at Richmond. Richmond needs to go down to only one date. Either that or just make the second Richmond race a dirt race like we had in NASCAR Heat 4 and 5 and shit. Like, I'm, I'm honestly surprised that Bo Bowman winning at that track didn't make Richmond lose a date. Oh, Bowman's win at Richmond did was just take Richmond out of the chase. Like, honestly, Richmond should only have one date. Honestly, a lot of the tracks in the Cup Series should only have one date. Like, in my honest opinion, the only tracks in that in the Cup Series that should have only two dates are Daytona and Charlotte. Be only because those two tracks have road course have rovals configured into them. So it may, so it makes sense for that. I would even go as far as maybe say maybe Indianapolis should have two dates too, so that we can have the oval and the road course. Because everyone's been asking. What should we do? Should we listen to the fans that want the oval back or the fans that want the road course back? I honestly say just give Indianapolis two fucking dates so that and run and have it on both configurations. Therefore, both fan bases win. Both sides of the fan base win and we make everybody happy. That would be the easiest solution to fix to solve that Indianapolis problem, but that solution probably won't happen because that makes too much sense. And NASCAR's got to make this as confusing as possible. But yeah, and honestly in this race, I was honestly rooting for Bush at the end of this race so that Blaney and Truex could both be knocked out in more chaos. Because yeah, uh, because I because honestly the fact that Blaney and Truex can now be knocked out is fucking stupid. Like that like honestly I talked about how stupid this chase format was last week. It still is fucking stupid. I will be perfectly honest, season long points format are are a better way to go than the chase grid. And by the way, I know I know I mentioned Chase Elliott's 116 points ahead of Blaney in second in the championship. But what if I told you the championship would be a lot closer under F1 points? Because under F1 points, Chase Elliott would be only eight points ahead of Ross Chastain. Just thought I just I think I'd give some food for thought right there for everybody that's against season long points. And everyone complains, saying, Oh, nobody wants to see season long points. Nobody wants to see Chase Elliott clinching with two or three races remaining in the season. That would be boring as fuck. And here's the funny thing about that. Someone actually went and did some research and checked out the points under season long points from every year in the modern, for in the modern era until 2003. And funny thing is, from 1988 to 2003, as I'll show on the screen, the regular season championship was either the, the championship was either decided in the season finale or was locked up with a race remaining. Like under a season-long points format, the last time a championship was decided with two or more races left in the year, you have to go all the way back to 1987 with Dale Earnhardt when Dale Senior locked up the title with two races left in the season. Let that sink in. So yeah, I mean, regular season. The regular season for, I mean, a season long points format looks like it does its job well and produces entertainment. Hell, some of NASCAR's greatest championship battles have come under a season long points format. And fans want to cry with Wolf because that's not entertaining enough. I mean, look at IndyCar this year. 
top four in IndyCar, only separated by 30-something points. And how many years has IndyCar's championship gone down to the season finale under a season-long points format? I believe it was 16 or 17 years in a row and counting. Looking like it's going to be 18 years in a row, if I'm correct, from the looks of it this year. Seems like season-long points work in IndyCar. Look at ARCA this year. We have an exciting three-man battle for the championship between Nick Sanchez, Roger Carruth, and Daniel Dye. Seems like season-long points work in ARCA. Well, hell, look at the fucking Penny Series. That's a wide-open championship between guys like Kevin Lacroix, DJ Kennington, Andrew Ranger, Mark Antoine Cameron, etc. Seems like season-long points work in IndyCar, work in the Penny Series. Look at Modifieds, a very close championship battle between guys like John McKennedy and Ronnie Silk. Seems like season-long points work in Modifieds as well. Season-long points, honest, honestly, I say this. Season-long points over the gimmick chase grid format. I will fucking die on this hill gladly. The chase grid is stupid and dumb. But here's the bad news about the chase grid. We're stuck with this format for at least two more years. Because NBC wants this format. So NBC's calling the shots over it. Because they want that guaranteed Game 7 moment and the finale. They want that manufactured drama. Instead of letting it come naturally. And the funny thing was, for season-long points, didn't F1 last year have the championship go down to the finale with the top two tied in the championship? Someone correct me if I'm wrong if that happened or not. Because I recall last year in F1, Hamilton and Verstappen entered tied for the championship last year entering Abu Dhabi for the finale. Seems like, seems like a season-long points format works in F1 as well. But everyone wants to cry because a season-long points format is not exciting enough to their fucking standards. Tell you right, season-long points format has honestly been a better way to crown a champion than this fucking gimmick crapshoot that we have. Promise, though, we can't get rid of this format till at least 2025. We're stuck with it for two more years until the NBC contract expires. And it's a situation right now where NASCAR has no fucking leverage right now. So yeah, when you get mad at NASCAR for the chase grid, don't get mad at them. Get mad at NBC because they're the dumb fucks that actually think this format is a legitimate way to crown a champion. When we've seen clear as day how many fucking times under this format that this format is an illegitimate way to crown a champion. Hell, just listen to Chris Busher's post-race interview. When Chris Busher talked about his third place finish saying that it, he feels like he should be excited for it. But it means nothing under this format. It doesn't matter. Like, even Chris Busher knows how fucking stupid and dumb this format is. Even Busher knows how fucking stupid this is. Like, it is fucking stupid where we're in a position to where both were two drivers in the top five in points may not be allowed to compete for a championship. While guys that while guys like Cindric and Briscoe. Who have and Kurt Busch, who have won one race this year, have done fuck all really since that win, and can make it in because of the whole win and you're in thing. Like this season alone has proved how fucking stupid this chase format is, especially with the amount of parity we've had in the Cup Series. Honestly, I can't wait to see what kind of stupid bullshit we'll have in the chase to decide which driver, which underserving driver, wins the title over the best driver all season. But anyway, with that quick rant out of the way, let's take a look at the standings for Trucks and Cup after Richmond. So here is the Truck Series Chase Grid after Richmond entering the cutoff race at Kansas next month. So Chandler Smith and Grant Enfinger, both of them are safe and locked into the next round on with wins. So six spots are up for grabs entering Kansas in a month's time. But Zane Smith, John Hunter, Nemechek, Ty Majewski, and Stuart Friesen, they're all pretty safe on points. I don't see either of them falling out unless something drastically disastrous happens to either of them. Ben Rhodes is in a good spot, too, 21 points above the cut line. Ben Rhodes just needs to have a solid run, stay clean, stay out of trouble, have a solid points day, and Ben Rhodes will move on to the next round. But that eighth and final spot is when it gets interesting because Matt Crafton only three points ahead of Carson Hosevar and Chick Christian Eckes is only six points out. So those three are separated by a total of six points. So Matt Crafton, he either just has needs to have a solid run 
or stay close to host of Varn Akis to lock in. Host Varn Akis, they need to have gain some points and need to finish ahead of Kraft and buy a few spots to make it in or ahead of each other, etc. So it's a very close battle between those three for that eighth and final spot. Honestly, I hope that God Kraft and fucking Miss gets eliminated in the first round because I'm sick and tired of seeing Kraft and do the fucking bare minimum to bullshit his way further than he should be. But yeah, that is the Truck Series Chase Grid entering can the cutoff race at Kansas next month. So here is the Cup Series Chase Grid entering Watkins Glen next week after Richmond with two races left. So 10 spots are locked up. Three, six spots remain. But for every one that has won a race next week, all the winners can officially clinch their spots into the chase next week if we have a repeat winner. If we have a repeat winner next week, then every driver that's won a race this year will be officially locked into the chase. And of course, Ryan Blaney, he holds the 16th and final playoff spot by 26 points. But just understand this. If a driver below Blaney and Truex, like an Al Moreau or a Bubba Wallace or Eric Jones, etc., if any of those drivers get a win in the next two weeks, then that whole points battle between Blaney and Truex is 100% meaningless and will mean absolutely nothing. If someone below the cut line wins out. Because this format is fucking stupid that we could have two drivers in the top five in the points. Be eliminated because of the stupid fucking winning your end thing. But yeah. And also Corey LaJoy, he's risking elimination next week. Anthony Watkins Glenn. And don't worry about Cody Ware because we're about to dress him with the death note this week. Because while everybody else takes out their Metro cards and hops aboard the L train tonight, for Cody Ware, his ride home will be short-lived. Because he is the first driver to be officially mathematically eliminated from chase contention this year. At least he is finally first in something. So Cody Ware has arrived at Elimination Station. And for that, he's going somewhere different. Because... For his failures of having a solid season. His failures of getting a win this year. His failures of being consistent enough to make the chase this year. His failures of being consistent enough to make, to make the top 30 of points this year. His failures of getting the job done with Rick Ware Racing and being a cup caliber driver. And his hopes and dreams of winning a cup series championship this year. Consider his name written down in the death note. As his season and his hopes and dreams have been absolutely deleted, you goddamn bum. There's only one thing left to do. Gotta write their names in the death note. Delete. Delete, delete, delete. Delete, delete, delete. Delete, delete, delete. Delete, delete, delete.